How do you design a hotel booking service? Okay, so hotel booking system or service. So let me think about uh, functional requirements to start with. So we are talking about hotel booking system. So if, when when I talk about it, is it like a, something like booking.com or like Airbnb or maybe deserving a small hotel or something? Yeah, if you're familiar with hot, like booking.com, let's use that as an example for what we're trying to build. Sure. So like uh, booking.com, there can be multiple hotels. So there can be like uh, maybe getting, viewing a hotel page can be required, then adding hotel, maybe an administrator, then deleting, updating, kind of those normal operations from the hotels. Then do we want to search hotels? So maybe that's one of the requirement if you think that search. Then if if I have selected a room, it can be, I mean, uh, there can be multiple people uh, booking the same room at the same time. So, so one thing is, so are we going to be assigning room numbers upfront? Or I think most of the hotels, they assign room numbers at check-in. Yeah, good question. Good question. Uh, let's, for the sake of this exercise, assume that rooms are assigned during check-in. And we also do not want to double book um, occupancy. So just keep that in mind. Sure, sure. Yeah, those are most more about non-functional. So uh, requirements, so mainly concurrency, maybe not no double booking. Uh, so if we have only one uh, room available, then only one person should get, like for a particular room type, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, the room numbers are going to be assigned later. Uh, so searching hotels is one option. Then maybe like when we book a hotel, there will be order created, maybe reservation. Uh, that can be one option for requirement, maybe cancellations, payments. So wh what do you think, I mean, uh, in terms of the functional requirements? Yeah, this, 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 this looks good. Um, this looks good. Okay, sounds good. So... Then in terms of non-functional requirements, uh, let me see. So, and there, there are sometimes uh, like hotels, what they do is they do some kind of overbooking where, uh, where I mean, if the, like if there are, even if the hotel is sold out, they kind of book more rooms so that to prepare in terms of cal cancellations in future. Do we think, do we want to support that feature or? Are we good without it? Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. So maybe like initially we can leave, leave it out. But if you want to talk about it too, I'm kind of curious how you would approach that. So like, okay, so concurrency we discussed. I'm pretty sure scalability to the extent of booking.com, it's going to be highly scalable system. And uh, I, I think from latency perspective, I guess you should be doing hotel in general. We make sure it is fast. And I mean, even if it is like 150 milliseconds or such kind of view and even search, I think search should be fast in general. So I guess that is, could be one non-functional requirements. And uh, from security perspective, yeah, we want to make sure that uh, people have like logged in, they have their, I mean, the identity access management system is um, properly built. So even DDoS protection, rate limiter, so those are standard things. I think I would just assume that those kind of non-functional requirements would be good to get started. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, I think this would be a good start for us to make sure this is a good user experience so that they're not, you know, users don't get frustrated and don't drop off in the experience. And also from a performance um, and security perspective, right? So yeah, these non-functional requirements sound good. Sure, sure. So in terms of back end of go back of the envelope estimation, so there can be, I mean, uh, let's assume there are probably one million uh, maybe hotels and uh, each having some kind of hundred rooms, so maybe ten room types. I'm just I'm just uh, throwing some numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. What looks like the decent um, estimation. So maybe 10 room types, they can be king bed, they can be like suite or uh, on an average, maybe 
10 room types or five room types, I can assume. So that comes out to be total of uh, like 1 million hotels. So around 100 million rooms. So 100 million rooms are, if we talk about uh, room types, so 100 million rooms, if you talk about 5 million room types, and if you're reserving like per day, right? So per day, if you're reserving for maybe 10 years, so th that's going to be a lot of data to store. So every day, uh, let me come up with a data model also, and that, that will help define how much storage it will need. But uh, yeah, some it seems like it's going to be a pretty good number in terms of like, let's say if we are talking about reservations. Okay, yeah, and let's, let, let's just do like a quick estimation here. We don't need to get too deep here. Yeah, 1 million hotels, 100 rooms, so 100 million per day into 365 multiplied by 5 equal to around 180 billion rooms. Uh, yeah, so, so 180 billion rooms, and uh, that's going to be a lot of storage if you are storing every room reserved. So even if it is taking 100 bytes, per reservation. So it's going to be probably 18 terabyte, which is going to be huge. So we need reservation. We need some, like we can't store it on one server for sure. So the other thing I think here, since we don't want double, double booking, I think uh, we would need some kind of inventory uh, storage or so where we will have, uh, where, we'll, where we'll have like how many rooms are available, how many rooms are uh, kind of reserved. So that kind of data storage in terms of table um, we can have and we can surround it with uh, different uh, transactional features or uh, other concurrency control mechanisms to make sure we are uh, we are not double booking. So here I think um, here uh, also let me first go over some data model and maybe I'll Come up with those numbers. Sure. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah. So, but uh, the other thing is, I think these hotels will have a lot of images. I think so because you need when you are having viewing a king bed, you might want to scroll through the images. You might want to scroll through the images of the hotels. So there will be plenty of images. I think that can be stored in uh, maybe S three L come over in the data model, and uh, I, I think we'll need CDN coverage also. That I'll come up with the design. Mm -hmm. So even if it is 10 images, I mean, it's going to be huge storage even there. So I think it cannot be stored in relational at all. So let's see. I mean, if we talk about these system, let me see here. So we have, we can have probably some databases or services also I'll come up with. So, so maybe, I mean, uh, let me see. So if we talk about one hotel, so one hotel can have hotel ID, uh, then can have like its address, phone, I mean, those standard things that can be stored in a hotel. Let's see if I can reduce down the font for this one. So, and zip, uh, and other things, latitude, longitude, we can store all of these things. Then if we talk about a hotel room, so there can be hotel, there can be hotel rooms. So uh, I think, uh, so mostly it will be like room type. So hotel ID, then room type. I would go with the inventory first. Let's see inventory. So inventory storage. So for each room type, for a given date, how many uh, how many are the available rooms for the given room type? So available count and how many are the total room total room count for that particular day for the given room type? So I think this will be helpful for viewing the inventory of a given hotel for a given uh, date 
when we select dates and multiple dates also when we select mm -hmm. so that we can do in the inventory part and then let's see then the people can make reservations so uh, maybe some orders or reservation table we can have when when they are making reservation i mean for a given hotel which date i will need a start date and date and which rooms are being booked so room type kind of id i would say id here room type id so we can have more tables for room type uh, to room type room type id to room type information and all those things but mainly for that particular room type id what, how many rooms are being booked Got it. This makes sense. Like, I, I, I trust that you can do the same thing for um, a few other, like, you know, hotels and you know, other data models. Um, I'm more curious now, um, how would you design the system for this? I think every, everything up until here makes sense. Um, just for the sake of time, I wanted to speed through some of this. Sure, sure. So uh, system wise, let's see, and I'll come up with some APIs also. Then, so here, I think I'll create i'll have some services okay one is inventory service that is talking to maybe uh this is talking to um we can build cache also but let me first have database here so like inventory service talking to this data storage so what i would do is if we have a user so let's say user So the user, usually what I do is, I mean, for every page, I, I try to make sure the, like I build in a format where it's like backend for front end format, where if you have native, like I, if you have iOS, Android, mobile web, desktop web, or even if there is any other UI platform, they can share the same kind of backend. Uh, so because the UI is a lot similar, so that's why it reduced duplication. So I usually have some kind of back and forth front end experience or experience layer. Uh, that's mainly services. And for this one, I mean, for any of the servers that I'm going to have, I'll be having load balancer on top of it. So like for, if you are talking about a view hotel service, so for view hotel, there is a, going to be a hotel page that will be powered through such kind of experience layer, then we can have another something similar. We can have like, uh, let's see here. So if you're talking about viewing the hotel, so for that, if somebody is talking, trying to get about the inventory for that hotel, so they will call the inventory service also. So that will get the database but there can be situations where i mean let's say if they make a payment so if we are talking about kind of reservation experience uh, reservation so then it will be talking to the reservation service as well And it needs to talk to, I mean, when you do reservation, it will need to talk to the inventory also to make sure um, we are having, uh, I, I mean, we are having the right number of uh, rooms reserved so that both are in sync with each other. Let me go over that in a little bit. Sure. So we'll have kind of reservation database. So there can be a couple of approaches. We can do some kind of microservice based architecture where reservation service has dedicated database. Um, and they, they can be part of like the same database also. What it will help is, I mean, if we are doing transactions and all, uh, then uh, then having them on the same server would make life easier. But practically, if we think about bigger companies, you usually have different teams that are managing the viewing the part, uh, like different teams that are managing viewing part or reservation part. And there are plenty of complexities behind the scenes. So a lot of the companies prefer having separate databases and separate storages. That increases some complexity, but uh, let me go with that in a bit. So in case, let's say if somebody is making payments uh, and the payment fails, so I'll have in reservation, I'll have a status also. 
So where status can be probably, I would say maybe pending, if we want to support some kind of timeout, I'll come over to that pending, then complete maybe can be a state, then maybe cancel can be a state or uh, so if let's say a reservation is canceled or so, then we want to make sure the inventory is uh, reverted also, like available count, the ones that were reserved before, uh, that available count needs to increase because a reservation is canceled. So for that, I mean, whenever we make payment, a lot of the times the payment processor, they reach out to us in an offline way through some kind of events processing so or callbacks. So what I would do is maybe I'll create some kind of queuing mechanism as well. So where I'll have some kind of queue, event queue that uh, and I'll create a consumer also. So, so whenever, so this consumer will consume from those offline event queues and offline event queues will listen to uh, some kind of events, let's say payment failed. So it will listen to, I would say, it's a payment failed, some kind of topics. If you talk about Kafka or RabbitMQ, uh, those kind of, uh, like th those queues uh, do support listening to such kind of topics and events. So payment failure, or if it's probably, I mean, reservation canceled, so in all those use cases, I'm going to be, as soon as those events happen, I'm going to be listening to, I'm going to consume it, then I'm going to make the service calls, appropriate service calls to for reservation service to make sure that it is canceled or the state is updated. And I'm going to make call to inventory service also to update the inventory. So I can go a little bit into inventory service but let me first uh, uh let me first check this yeah and maybe or maybe we can kind of just walk through at a high level i think everything makes sense so far maybe walk through at a high level just from the user to booking a hotel like how like how all these services are working together just maybe in like a minute yeah yeah so when a user books a hotel they get the ui screen experience layer and they will be doing the orchestration uh, through different services. So when the user books the hotel, it will call reservation service and it will also call inventory service uh, to inventory service. What it will do is let me let me go over that one first. Okay. So, so the way I mean, since I mentioned about inventory table here and uh, reservation, so if so the way it will do it is like maybe I mean such kind of queries like selecting first I'll get the available count. I want let's say if there is only one room available, so I'll first get the available count from this inventory table. Uh, and let's say if I get this available count from the inventory table where it, if I have selected date between uh, some start date and end date. Uh, user provided let's say if i want to make from today to three days from now so in these i'll get the available count and i'll check if that available count uh available count is greater than what i'm requesting requested count so or maybe less than requested count in that case i can't book the hotel because mm -hmm. the rooms that room is not available. So for this one date hotel ID, I'll have uh, equal to some hotel ID and uh, room type for a given room type. So so if the available count is less than the requested count, then I can't book the room. In, in that case, uh, so. And here in that case, I would like to fail the, this, but uh, in here, I mean, I get the available count and then I update this inventory table, kind of. So update this inventory table. So set uh, 
I mean available count equal to available mm -hmm. count minus the requested count. Mm -hmm. So where where all these things? Okay. So what I see is like uh, if two users are trying to book a last room, so I can see some race conditions. Sorry, I'm going off track, but I think this is an important one in this particular design. So because we want to make sure it is not double booked. Right. So if, if I'm going with a relational database, so and uh, I'm checking the inventory uh, for the user here, like two users are trying to book the same room. So for both of the users, the available count will be one and requested count will be uh, one as well. So if available count is uh, less than the requested count right now, I mean, both of them will see available count is equal to requested count. So they will proceed here and they will both update the inventory and reduce the available count. So one of them can make the available count as negative. So this race condition, I think there can there are other there are multiple ways that we can protect it. I mean, we can protect it by adding a transaction on top of it. So we can do begin transaction and end here. But uh, when we do this, uh, there are multiple transaction isolation methods like read committed, read uncommitted, and uh, repeatable read and serializable. So if we do anything other than serializable then we will still run into the same issues. Uh, it's not, so what serializable helps is it, these transactions for one user, it will make sure that this, all these statements are executed once and uh, the other user is waiting, cannot, uh, like, cannot proceed. I mean, because only one transaction can uh, proceed in that serializable isolation level. So in that transaction, only one transaction will proceed. So uh, for user one, it will proceed and uh, inventory will be updated correctly. But for user two, the available count would be zero. So user two would be fine. In this case, the problem that I see over here is given that uh, it is serializable, we are blocking the transaction, we are blocking the code for a long time. And that can be inefficient. Potential of creating deadlocks, potential of creating, having users wait for a long time to get the room available. So it's not that, uh, I mean, it, it is good. I mean, it will solve the concurrency issue, but it's not going to be uh, that efficient. So yeah, so there are other ways. I mean, we can do select for update here. Uh, it will lock the room rows we don't need the transaction to be serializable there it will lock the rows it's still pessimistic locking there is other way where we can have a version in the in these like in these uh, tables so it's like optimistic concurrency control uh, that is helpful if they, there is no, not a lot of contention so and I think I'm just uh, going a little bit faster, but I think please, please interrupt if there are any questions. But there is another thing that I can think of is having database constraints, though it's not supported by all kinds of databases. But uh, sure. there's database constraints also, uh, where uh, I mean, I can create a constraint. Um, and and actually, be, before like getting too deep into this, I, I appreciate you walking through how you would optimize this race condition or how you would solve for it. I think this here makes sense. Um, for the sake of time, and I think your overall system design makes sense here, I would love to, to discuss some other optimizations you would make. So um, race condition aside, are there any other optimizations that you think could be made in your design? So uh, one thing is inventory. I mean, yes, uh, from the speed perspective, like we mentioned, it should be 150 milliseconds, which is pretty high, which is pretty like, I would say strict uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the SLA. So mm -hmm. we can create some kind of cache here uh, for inventory service where, although I think the ultimately the booking part, when you are ready to book, ultimately it will go to the database and validates all these through constraints and make sure there is no double booking. But when a user is seeing, they can see some kind of uh, 
they, that inventory service can talk to some kind of cache. Let me see if there is a there is no cache, but yes, I think uh, we can have a block for cache that inventory service talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, with before talking to the database, so that cache can be built in a in multiple ways. I mean, that cache can store the available count for a given room type. A lot of the times, I mean, since people book well in advance, maybe one month in advance, and uh, all those things, so we wouldn't go get into the conflicts later on when it comes to the database. But yeah, so we can store the available count for a given room type in those caches, cache, and whenever it is booked, either we can have we can update the cache offline uh, to improve the booking performance. Uh, we can remove the value, like delete from the cache also, so that next time when you read, you're reading from the database. So if you delete the cache value. I mean, it will be slower next time. So I, I would prefer that when we do a booking, it goes through the same event queue mechanism, uh, like some kind of uh, event that happens and that consumer will uh, update the cache for okay. the event. So that's one option, one optimization. Then I, then I was mentioning uh. about images, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think that's great. Um, now, for the sake of time, um, I, in, in, instead of diving, diving into the same level of details for other optimizations, can you just speak high level of uh, like, what are some other optimizations you might make if you had more time to work on the system design? Yeah, I mean, one thing is images, I think I mentioned before. So images will be stored in the S3, in S3, and uh, that can be retrieved through CDN, that is ge geography look located and um, because the images take a lot of space and bandwidth as well so that's one option mm -hmm. then other things uh, I mean not optimizations but there can be some like uh, concurrency issues with when I talked about just inventory service but if we talk about updating inventory as well as reservation like those two tables at the same time, because we what we want to make sure is as soon as you reserve a room, that reservation entry should be there and inventory should be updated. Both of them should be at the same time. So that one, if you are going with the microservice kind of architecture, I mean, there are multiple ways like two phase commit is one option. And uh, there are there is something called Saga also. So that helps in concurrency control and making sure that those two tables are in sync. So that's that that's that will be helpful. And even I mean, if if you are double booking, I think there are ways to optimize uh, um, ways to control the. I mean, make sure that uh, people are not there are no two entries that are added to reservation table also uh, for the same reservation, but by smartly creating the IDs. Let me think about any other way to optimize this. I think that's I, I think that's that's fine for this exercise, uh, Niraj. And I think we're at time now. So um, thank you for walking through how you would design this hotel booking service. We talked about functional and non-functional requirements. You gave us an estimation. We walked through like a high-level design. We went deeper there. We talked about optimizing for uh, solving for the race condition and optimizing for a few other things. Um, now. And I, I think for, for the purposes of, of an exercise or an interview, this is the kind of details that we would get into. Now, uh, before we close out the video, um, given your years of experience doing system design, do you have any tips for the audience if they were to face the same kind of question around booking a hotel system? Yeah, I think uh, most of the system design questions, one thing to remember is mainly we should follow the right format. It's System design is just a kind of snapshot of what you will encounter in the real life. So in real life, if we have product requirements and we want to make sure that we are building a system that is tying to that, those product that is adhering to the, those product requirements. So that's why mm -hmm. we come up with functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and whatever system we are designing, it's based on estimation. 
if something does doesn't fit on the server then only we do i mean we can do sharding also here because uh, that i couldn't get to but uh, there are multiple ways but we have to make sure that we are solving for the problem in hand so that's why a lot of these steps are important high level is important optimizations are important and uh, considering all those kind of use cases are important so definitely i think following the format uh, and uh, thinking through all the steps is definitely i would re recommend for sure great great advice thanks niraj and for the audience who are watching at home good luck i hope you found this helpful again these are typically asked in engineering or engineering manager typically in on sites or even in first round interviews so hopefully this is helpful and good luck in your upcoming system design interview. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.